What's it like to build with CNM Home Builders? When we built our first house, we had absolutely no idea what we wanted in a house. It was challenging, but CNM made the process super easy. Our project manager, he was very, very good communicating with us and, and talking to us about stuff that may pop up or stuff we got to come look at and, and things like that. I recommend it to all of our friends to build because it is so fun and you just get to pick out everything. So CNM just makes it so easy to do. Visit cnmhomebuilders.com. Ten, nine, eight. Ignition sequence has started. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Your untold radio AM. And now broadcasting from a secret location, your hosts, Joel Sturgis and Doug Hychek. Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Untold Radio AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis. Right along with me is Mr. Alex Hychek. You really think you could go a week without hearing from at least one of the high checks? Ha! Joke's on you. No, Doug is over there in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I'm not sure what he's doing, and nor do I really want to know, because I'm sure it's, you know, Sin City and stuff. But we do have Alex high check. Doug's son sitting in. You guys remember Alex? I think, um, what, about a month ago you did a sit-in, Alex? Yep, yeah, exactly. And so tonight- how the hell you been? Good. Just going to try to not screw up tonight too bad. Oh, don't worry about it. You know what? Radio is a lot like a wedding. Even if you do screw up, no one realizes it was a screw up. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, because it's, you know, it's live. Don't worry about it. Well, why don't you, what, what do you, Alex, I've never talked to you really before in depth. What do you do with yourself? Who, what makes uh, Alex High Check Alex High Check? Wow, that's uh, putting me on the spot here, Joel. Uh, I, Hey, man, that's what I do. I do that to your poor dad all the time. Uh, what makes me tick? Well, yeah, well, what? okay, what do you do for work? Um, so I, with with my brother and my father, we run a uh, weather stripping company that makes classic carts for, uh, uh, it, it, we make parts for classic cars, primarily rubber parts. Very cool. Very. How long have you been doing that? Since forever or what? Uh, as soon as I got out of college. Yeah. So about 10 yeah. years. Yeah. So you, you like GM or what's your role over there? Yeah. Gen- general manager. Yeah. Yeah. We've got. You a must man. like it. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it keeps you busy. I mean, stuff's always changing. I mean, in the business environment, it's nothing unique to us. Uh, you know, it's constant change mm-hmm. of laws and marketing and distribution and, just trying to, you know. What's your favorite part of the job? Uh, marketing is always fun. Um, yeah. You know, finding, I mean, there's, I mean, even just like with this, you know, with, with podcasting, the ways to reach people is always changing and it's kind of exciting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is exciting, you know, because radio's changed and podcasting's taken over and and it's, it's, it's really cool because of, uh, the options and and the possibilities given to everybody now but what about you joel like you know um have you been into radio forever i have been in radio working in radio in one capacity or another since i was 16 years old and i I, have you guys now 47 have you guys ever you know Talked about how you got into the strange, the paranormal, the cryptozoology. Yeah, a little bit, a little, little bit. Uh, let's see, my radio career, I began it uh, when I was 16. It was one of these part-time jobs um, that I wasn't going to do forever because I wanted to do other things in my life. And so I started that job uh, on the weekends as a kid. And then before you know it, one year turned into two years and three years, four years, and five years, and so on. And um, I was working at uh, at a place, at, well, at a WEVE up, up near where I live. And I was a DJ, which is just spinning music, right? I would say the time of the temp, like, hey, you're listening to WEVE, and we're going to be playing a little bit of Rolling Stones, and we come back. 
we got heart for you. You know, stuff like that. You know, in the normal time, temperature, kind of DJ, like what you hear every day of the week right now. Anyway, and um, I wanted to get into talk radio because I had a couple of, I was a board op for a couple of talk radio shows at night to make a few extra bucks in the AM side. And one of those shows was the Coast to Coast AM brand. And I was the board op for my station. Like I'd flip the switch so they could come on. But because I was doing that, I would also be able to be in contact with the show. And I got to know like the hosts really well. And um, and the host said, hey, you know, you you because you, you, we talk afterwards here and there. And I, you know, I was really interested. And he says, why don't you give this a try? I mean, you know. So I gave it a try and I did all right with it. And then uh, uh, we had a, an hour time slot opening on the, that same AM channel from 8 to 9 p.m. Central Time that nobody was filling. I mean, that was really kind of the dead hour, like 8 to 9. Oh, my God, it's a horrible time slot for radio because everybody's already come home from work. People are not listening to radio at this point usually. And, I, and so I went down to the general manager's office. His name was Dennis. And I said, hey, Dennis, I, I think I could probably fill that hour that we need to fill over there on the AM Talk radio channel. And, and and he was reading a newspaper, and he kind of lowers the newspaper. He looks at me, and he goes, tell you what, I'm going to give you one time, one time slot. Here's the deal. On the AM side, but it has to be after hours. And so I used to host a radio show called After Hours AM, and that's how it got its name. It's an homage to him saying, I'm going to give you one hour, but it has to be after the station closes after hours on God, the AM side. Yeah. And so that's how that, that's, I still used it, you know, once in a while, even to this day. And so then um, I, I started doing that show and it just kind of snowballed and moved and, and, and grew in popularity. It was local, you know, it was primarily a local show. And then um, after that grew, I ended up working for a, a national show, uh, iHeartRadio for a few years, many years, worked for them. And then uh, did radio and, and broadcasted until... You know, until radio started changing into podcasting and live radio wasn't really needed anymore. Like it, yeah, I mean, as much, you know, and so that created an opportunity in the auto industry for me to go work for uh, basically O'Reilly's now auto parts. And so that's that. That's that in a nutshell. When you when you did your first show, I mean, did they give you like uh were you able to pitch like what you wanted to do, who you wanted to interview, what you wanted to talk about? Like, how did that start? Well, what had happened is, is, is he said, I'll give you this, uh, this hour. You need to go seek out our, our program director named Bob. His name was Bob at the time. And Bob, he, 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 he was an interesting guy, Bob. He's still around, but he's not in radio anymore. And Bob was kind of one of these guys that he was great until about 6 p.m. after that he, you could tell he's been nipping at the bottle a little bit so i would i would try to get these big see he was he did not want paranormal radio on the on the airwaves because i pitched that right away let's do a show that we can have call-ins and talk about the strange and unusual and bob's like nope we're gonna be talking politics what yeah politics that's that's what we want your show to be is politics I don't do politics. (laughs) I don't care about politics. I want to talk about the strange unusual. So it took about a month. And after the show was, and I hated it. I mean, politics is local politics. Talking about this, talking about that, you know, talking about school levies or what town's doing this or what town's doing that. Talking to whatever mayor. So finally what I did was I, I ended up, I ended up booking here and there, it got to be about Halloween time. And I ended up booking Lorraine and Ed Warren on the show. And they were, you know, even then were kind of big names in the paranormal. But everybody knew them from TV at this point already. So they were, either, I had to kind of convince their handler to allow them to come on for a, a half hour slot on this radio show that I was doing. And so I, I convinced them that, you know, I'm not going to make a mockery of them. I'm not going to make fun of them because, you know, back in those days, they would only go on certain radio shows with certain people that they knew would handle them in a certain way, right? And so I was just outsider coming in going, hey, I want to interview you guys for a half hour. Now it's really easy. You just email somebody up 
and they'll get back to you and boom, you got them. Back in those days, you had to go through their handlers and their management. And I finally got them on the air and we did a half hour segment and it was the biggest, highest rated part of that show I'd ever seen, ever. Like people were calling the station going, oh my God, that was so great. I'd love to hear more of that. And so after that feedback came, it kind of gave me some leverage at that point with the program director saying, hey, look at this. We've had more listeners to the show now, which if any program director and any management you're going to meet in radio, it has to translate into sponsorship dollars. So if they had a large radio audience, they could care less about the content then. They want the sponsorship dollars. So I ended up getting a lot of sponsors on board because it became a very listened to radio show. And so that's how that got steam was because of that. That one half hour where I didn't drop the ball with Ed and Lorraine Warren. And uh, did you have to fight to, you know, get that that initial spot to even try this out? Because it sounds like. Oh, they... yeah. Yeah, it was that program director. You know, after the general manager had given the green light, because what did he care? It's a one hour at well, at that point. When he said after hours, he meant 11 p.m. at night. 11 to midnight was my original time slot. And I was hoping for that 8 to 9. Because even though it was crappy, that time slot, it was still what would be considered at the end of prime time. At least you had a chance to get listeners. But between 11 and midnight, there was it was crickets. I mean, nobody was listening until Coast to Coast AM came on at midnight. So it, their, listener, their listenership was so low at that point, at that hour, that it was, they were playing whatever was free, whatever was being piped in from, I think it was at that time was Dial Global was doing what they call canned radio. Like when you hear these DJs now on, on the radio and they're clearly not from your market and they're just adding crap in, that's canned radio, that's, that's, that's voice, that's voice tracked radio. And so that's what they were doing at that time. And then uh, we ended up making that uh, really a popular hour that they ended up expanding the show three hours total. So it went from at, at, the, at, the, at its height, at the AM side of things, it went all the way, what was it, seven? No, it was from 8 p.m. all the way to midnight. That's a huge so it block. Ended up being a, yeah, it ended up being like a four-hour block at the end. And, and they, they were really happy with it. And then uh, what the only reason why it kind of fell off the map was the station got sold to a big radio conglomerate. And they wanted to turn that station into sports radio. Oh, and they didn't want to pay anybody. They, wanted Fo- they were a Fox affiliate. So they wanted Fox Sports to come on. And so that was the end of that one. It was a fun run, though. It was a six-year run. That's that's a long time to be on the air for and having that that four hour block. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it, it got it got hard because the problem with that now is you start burning through a lot of guests. Yeah, I mean the guest list because back in those days we're talking this is circa nineteen ninety nine, nineteen ninety eight. So we're talking the paranormal wasn't as big as as, a, as it exploded at this point like it is today. And I'm assuming, so it was, and you didn't have the Facebook groups and the blogs, nothing. And nothing. All these internet things. was very just fledgling, like dial up at this point. So and, it was, a, and so it was a different so you, time. So you went through like pretty much every major person in that niche. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then we started expanding because of the success. We ended up getting movie stars on. We ended up uh, horror icons. You know, stuff like that. So we kind of expanded it because we had to, because we were running out of people to talk to, you know, was the problem. So we like uh, had like J- Kane Hodder on and Robert England on and, you know, the guy that g- guy that played uh, Jason Voorhees and, and, uh, and of course, Freddy Krueger and stuff like that, just to try to keep it somewhat fresh. But then we ended up opening up the call lines to people with their own stories and that helped a lot. Did you uh, did you have it structured where like the first hour you guys would do an interview and then you'd... yeah our first our first hour was dedicated to um, 
general kind of generalish talk like news of the day you know le- legitimate headlines of the day so we talk news second hour we kind of move into the paranormal uh we would have the guest on at the end of the second hour he'd be on or she'd be on for an hour the last hour was just call-ins like people would call in with their strange encounters very much like a coast-to-coast am if you've ever listened to a coast-to-coast AM. yeah yeah yeah, very much like that. It was patterned. Everybody's pretty much patterned after coast to coast AM. Most people are because that's the best form, formula that works anyway. And did you have a co-host, or did you um, did you do it all by yourself? Other than all by myself. Wow, all by myself. So yeah, yeah. Back in those days, it was uh, well mainly because they didn't want to they didn't want to hire anybody. Yeah. You know, because then they, they'd have to pay that extra person to come in. Well, heck, they were only paying me at this point. They were paying me a whopping $5.75 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was pretty cheap labor, you, you know, that kind of stuff. And so you just kind of go through it and you, uh, you get uh, you get better at it and you get better at it and you just enjoy it. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's 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 how you know, what, what happened to me. What do you want to do in podcasting, Alex? Anything that you have a vision? Um, do I have a vision? Um, <laughs> yeah, what you want to do? Do you I could see you doing your own podcast. What would it be on? Oh boy! Well, what is your favorite hobby? I did hear you bought a Tesla. Oh, you're, you're confusing me with Blaine. Yeah, he just got. Oh, a Tesla. Blaine bought a Tesla. Yep. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. All right, gotcha. Well, you know, what is your passion outside of your job? Well, I mean, you know, work is my life, Joel. I mean, really. I understand that. Are Are you a Squatch fan? You know, uh, of, of course, I think, you know, all the high checks are. But, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I'm like the reverse of the Bermuda Triangle. Like, weird stuff happens to the high checks all the time, and I, I seem to be the opposite. Like, you know, if you want to be haunted, if, if you're haunted, come visit me. You're, you're never going to be visited by a ghost again. You've never had a paranormal thing happen to you? I mean... You know, tiny little stuff, but in comparison to the rest of my family, it just seems to completely elude me. Like, for you know, for a good reason or a bad reason, uh, y- you know, it's uh, very boring over here, Joel. Well, that's okay though. I mean, you're like that that grounding effect, right? Yeah. So all this crazy stuff's going on around you, and the gr- you're the grounding effect that brings everything back down to earth. Right. So we, we, you need those too. You got to have the grounding effect, you know, people that aren't so paranormal magnet kind of person, the E thing. What about, what about you, Joel? Have you, um, obviously you're fascinated with the topic, but like, was that splurged on because of something? Let me tell you a tale. I got a story for you. When I was a young man, well, I shouldn't say young. Make it sound like I'm 9,000 years old over here. <laughs> um, when I was a young whippersnapper. Uh, no, I was working at a radio station. I was working at a country music radio station. And I used to run the graveyard shift. Oh, God. The graveyard shift at a country music radio station. Let me tell you, there is no worse time that could be had. That's like the purgatory of radio right there. You, know, you haven't decided whether you're going to hell or if you're going to go to heaven yet. But you're stuck right there. So here I am in Radio Purgatory, playing country music. And every Sunday morning before, uh, you know, every Sunday morning, there would be a guy that would come in, and he was the real article cowboy. I mean, this guy used to bust Bronx, ride bulls, dig cattle drives. I mean, a real cowboy, right? Lived it, breathed it, was it. Owned a ranch, did the whole thing. At this point, Roy in his life was about, what was he, about 82, 83 years old. And this was his career he always wanted to be into, his radio. And so now he was hosting his own one-hour-long classic country 
music show on Sunday mornings called On the Trail with Cowboy Roy. I know, very original, right? Yeah. So my day is wrapping up, and this would have been a, a Saturday night going into Sunday morning. And Roy would always come into the break room. It was a two-story radio station, and the break room was just off of the studios. So inside the break room, you had your microwaves, you had your coffee pots, you had your normal stuff that you'd expect to see in a break room. And every that time, I'd put a long set on, getting ready for Roy to come in, because it took him a little bit to get ready and get into the studio and do this and do that. So I'd put an extra long 20-minute block of music on in preparation for his show to come on. Well, every time that he would come in, we would go in that break room and we would talk about whatever. And he was a big baseball fan. And we were talking baseball and this and that and what have you. You know, mainly it was baseball that morning. And and, and uh, Roy says, well, I got to hit the trail. He'd always say that. And he went went in the studio. I saw him get behind the, uh, into the chair, behind the microphone, get everything going. And he started doing a show, which is fine. So I go downstairs. And, and the general manager is downstairs on a, get, on a Sunday morning, Alex, a Sunday morning. A Sunday morning. General managers are never in studio at a radio station on Sunday mornings. They are generally half drunk or hung over on Sunday mornings. So they are never, ever, ever there. Never. And his name was Steve Carlson. And I ran into Steve and he said... Hey, Joel, how you doing? And I said, Steve, what the hell are you doing down here? Because I'd gone downstairs to leave. He says, well, did, did, did anyone talk to you during your shift? Did you get any phone calls at the stage? No. Why would I? Normal, normal night. Roy died last night. I'm here to fill a spot until we can find somebody else. What? What do you mean Roy died last night? Roy's not dead. He's upstairs, and I can take you upstairs and show you Roy's very much alive. No, he says, I know you two are close. I want to tell you, before anyone else was able to tell you, that Roy passed away last night in his sleep. He, he, had, he, had, a, he had a stroke, and, and, and he went peacefully. You're, you're full of it, Steve. He's upstairs. So we went upstairs. I'm like, you know what? Come on, Steve, let's go upstairs. You're losing your marbles, Steve. So we go upstairs and there is no Cowboy Roy. N- he's just not gone. There. Gone. Just gone. Banished. But do you remember when I told you that we sat in the break room and we talked for a little while? Yeah. Cowboy Roy drank a cup of coffee. And he smashed that cup and threw it in the garbage. That cup was there in the garbage. So what was like? What was going through your head? Like, like did it oh, not hit well, you at first? It 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 it. it I was what? Were you what in the shock? Hell was, I was in shock. Know? I mean, I was in shock for about thirty seconds, and, and and I'm like, and my second, I don't know. After the thirty seconds, was holy f bomb. I talked to a dead person for like. 10 minutes are, are you in what what this is not possible to happen this does not happen this never had this is impossible no this this did not happen i obviously was imagining things but the evidence was there the physical evidence that he left behind was still there i couldn't deny that and i remember talking to him and so then General manager looks at me and says, you know, you've been working a lot of midnights. Maybe you should take a day off or two days <laughs> off or something, you know, you know, because things are getting to you a little bit. And I knew this happened. And, and But the worst part wasn't that. The worst part was the following week when you're going, you do not come here, Roy. You do, If I see you now, I will flip a lid. If you come up these steps... I will go nuts because then I'll know. Because at that point, I didn't know he was dead. I had no idea. It didn't oh, even cross my mind. But now if he shows up, I mean, no, he's stone cold dead. Then what do I do with myself? So, I mean, at that point, reflecting on your experience, did anything seem off after knowing what you had found out about the whole interaction? 
Did he seem not really? Not- it wasn't like it, you know. A lot of people would expect me to it, this to be a big goodbye. Like, well, you're not going to see me around yeah. anymore. I'm doing it. Nope. Went to work. It it was none of that big speech of well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be going away, and it's been nice knowing you. Not a thing. Nothing. He went to work. Do you think he knew he was dead? I don't think he did. I don't think he knew he was dead. I I just don't think he I don't I think he probably died in the middle of his sleep. And in spirit or whatever you want to call it, got up and went about his routine. So you think he just uh he just was completely oblivious at that point. I, I, I maybe. I mean, you know, because I've I've asked as many paranormal experts, and I use air quotes there because there are no experts in this because we don't even know anything about it really. What I what I was dealing with. Well, it was a departure visit. It was this. It was that. No, it was freaking crazy, is what it was. You, you, you know, and because and, and they always say, well, did he say goodbye or was there this and was there that? And, I, and you would think there would be, but there really wasn't. It was just him going to work, doing what he loved. And that was it. And, and, and there was no big, you know, grandiose goodbyes. I think it was a man doing what he enjoyed doing. Didn't realize that the end had come. And and that's it. I I I I don't have any explanations for that. So like, where was like, where were you at worldview wise, like before that experience, and then after? Were you just like slightly into the topic? It's kind of a fun, quirky I, thing, and then after, yeah. Like, oh. I, I mean, I'd done the show, and I had interviewed all these paranormal people and had fun with it, but I was definitely a skeptical believer. Because I, uh, I never, I mean, I've had some little things like everybody, you know, little paranormal things, but never anything that would make me go, uh-huh, that the up, they're real because there's a ghost, right? It was just little things that, it, you know, most people would say they experience, you, you, you know, and, but that changed everything that moment. That moment was paradigm shifting for me. So were you hungry for more of that or were you scared out of your mind? I mean, at first I was scared out of my absolute wits. Not because, because I, I had to process, I had to digest it. I had to think, okay, all right, now, now what? I mean, what's the point? I mean, what's going on here? And then after I kind of settled down, I had an understanding in my own head, came to grips with what I witnessed. Then the questions start asking. I start asking the questions. Well, how does this work? When you die, do you know you're dead? Or or are you still around? Or, or can you choose to do things like that? I mean, how does this thing all work? And so that's really kind of what got me into actually going out and looking for ghosts. And has anything like that on that level ever happened to you again, or has this been a no. one in a lifetime thing? That, that was a once one and done for me. You, you, you know, uh, I, I've never had, I mean, sure. I've talked to ghosts, uh, via EBP. I, I've, I've had brief sightings of ghosts, you know, from the, you know, here and there, but I've never had anything to that level happen to me ever again and i gotta say a small part of me is happy about that <laughs> <laughs> oh i understand yeah you, you, you know I, I i want to if there's paranormal and if the, and if it's real which which i can attest my experience yes it is absolutely real i want to i want to dip my toes into slowly but no, I was forced to jump into that pool of the unknown, unwittingly, full on. What's it like to build with CNM Home Builders? When we built our first house, we had absolutely no idea what we wanted in a house. It was challenging, but CNM made it, the process super easy. Our project manager, he was very, very good communicating with us and, and talking to us about stuff that may pop up or stuff we got to come look at and, and things like that. 
I recommend it to all of our friends to build because it is so fun and you just get to pick out everything. So CNM just makes it so easy to do. Visit cnmhomebuilders.com. Hi, I'm a UCare simplifier, which means I make your individual and family plan process nice and simple. Let's go through it step by step. Step one, go to minsure.org. Step two, see if you qualify for a subsidy. Step three, say EGADS. UCARE has some of the lowest rate plans in the state with a ton of benefits and a super large network so I can keep my doctor. Well, you don't have to say EGADS. Just trying to bring it back. UCARE, people-powered health plans. Go to minsure.org to enroll today. So, yeah, that's that's the story of my encounter talking to a dead man for like 10 minutes. <laughs> It was the craziest thing ever, Alex. I am so telling you, it was crazy, my friend. That sounds like an X Files episode. It it it's 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 been it was nuts. It was nuts. Speaking of nuts, we gotta get out of here. We got Tim Storms yeah. come on the show. You're not gonna want to go anywhere. Not that he's nuts. Topic matters gonna be fun. It's gonna be a nutty good time. Don't go anywhere. We're gonna be right back right after this. Hi, Tom Bodette. If you can hear me, then you have an internet connection, which means you can do cool things online, like listen to streaming radio, obviously, or watch a video of a monkey washing a cat. Let your freak flag fly. Or you can book a room at a great price at motel6.com. Isn't the internet wonderful? Everything you want right at your fingertips and, whoa, did not need to see that. <clears throat> I'm Tom Bodet from Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. My student loan is totally paid off. I can't believe it. I can't believe it either. I paid more than the minimum each month, and soon enough, it was gone. So you're just giving up? Giving up on what? The life of luxury. Egyptian cotton, caviar Thursdays, designer everything. What are you talking about? Our plan. What happened to winning the lottery and mastering the art of the perfect mimosa? Hosting galas, wearing enough jewelry to require a bodyguard, vacationing in the French Riviera, and then buying it. I just thought maybe it was time to prepare for my future. You know, set some financial goals, make some smart investments, open a 401k. Financial goals? Investments? A 401k? You are horrified right now. Listen, if winning the lottery were easy, everyone would do it. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Northern Tool and Equipment. So me and the boys head out to tailgate today and find some other fans in our spot. Well, it happens. Yeah, cheering for the wrong team. Oh, this is war. Even worse, they've got this couch set up and everything. A couch? Yeah, it's a uh, sectional. All right, first thing, don't ever use the word sectional again. Done. Second, I want you to grab a 4,700-pound tow chain with J-hook and grab hammer. Throw that on the back of your truck. Got it. Now you're going to hail Mary the J-hook over the end of that couch. Time to find a better spot for your new friends. That should do it. There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Taking a family of five to the amusement park can cost a small fortune. Oh, yeah. So to save some money, we thought, hey, let's bring the amusement park to us. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, step right up. Step right up, young man. Are you ready to ride the wacky waterfall? That's just the bathtub with the shower head running. Nope, it's the Wacky Waterfall. It's the shower, Dad. Waterfall. Wacky. There's an easier way to save. To get a free rate quote, go to Geico.com. Then buy online, over the phone, or at your local Geico office. Green light. Hey, girl. School zone. I'm getting hungry. Car changing lanes. You want to meet me for pizza? Stop sign. Intersection clear. Yeah, street. Pizza sounds good. Ball in street? Girl in street! <gasps> It's hard to concentrate on two things at once, like texting and driving. Stop the text, stop the wrecks. How will you stop texting and driving? Tell us at StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council.
And welcome back to Untold Radio AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis. Right along with me is Mr. Alex Hycheck. Not Doug Hycheck, Alex Hycheck. Some would say we have the best high check on the air right now. I'm just saying. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying <laughs> I heard a rumor that we might have the best high check on the air right now. Tonight, we're going to have a great show in store for you tonight. We have world-renowned cryptozoologist, monster hunter, all-around great guy, joining us up super-duper early where he is, too. So we're going to have to thank, you, thank him for that, too, because he's, he's just hanging out, waiting to be introduced. We have uh, Mr. Richard Freeman on the show. He is one of the foremost experts on hunting creatures of the strange, He's such as the Yeti. The Mongolian death worm. We're going to have to get into what the Mongolian death worm is. That is for sure. And as well as many other, other creatures. I'd like to welcome to the show, Mr. Richard Freeman. Hi, thanks for having me, lad. Hey, how you been, Richard? Not so bad. Not so bad. Uh, I mean, Good. COVID has, has put the kibosh on the last couple of expeditions I was going to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Get back into it next year right right i mean that's what we all can hope for is is just to get back to some normalcy here yeah oh you know that that'd be great you know so yeah so where are you from richard uh i'm from england uh, i was born in a rather dull uh banal ugly little town called Nuneaton in the midlands um then I did my university days in Leeds in Yorkshire, which was much, much better. I had a great time at the university. And um, now I live down in Devon in the southwest of, of England, um, the bit that sticks out at the end like a leg. Oh, wow. Man, so so has monsters always been your passion? I mean, you know, tell us. I mean, yeah. what kind of got you into this? <laughs> well, <laughs> People always ask me that question. I give the same three-word answer. Classic Doctor Who. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. I, I grew up in the 70s um, with John Pertwee and Tom Baker as the Doctor. And John Pertwee in particular spent a lot of time on Earth because in the storyline he was trapped on Earth by the Time Lords. So every monster he, he battled or met was more immediate because it was on your doorstep. So you had things like giant glowing poisonous maggots coming out of slag heaps in Wales, um, intelligent humanoid dinosaurs rising up out of the sea, um, Lovecraftian tentacled monsters that can animate plastic dummies and turn them into killers. It was, it was as much about horror as it was about science fiction. And that's got yeah. me fascinating with monsters. And I have to say, what is masquerading as Doctor Who at the minute with a female doctor and these woke yep. classy storylines, that isn't Doctor Who. That's excrement, and it's driven away sixty percent of the of the viewers. They. I was gonna. I was just about to ask you, how do you feel about the new Doctor Who is out there? And well, you answered it right there. It's, it's, it's not it's, the Doctor. It's, Jodie Whittaker is he, not the Doctor, and Chris Chibnall isn't interested in science fiction and horror. He's interested in using the show as a political football, just mm -hmm. uh, so him and his social justice warrior friends can bleat their woke, nasty, bigoted, anti-white male garbage. And it makes yeah. me sick. And they've both got the push. They've had the push now. So uh, Russell T. Davis is taking over again. So I hope he retcons uh, the, the last few years out of existence. Yeah. It's the only thing that will save the show. And it was once the best science fiction show ever it was oh yeah no you're right up there yeah definitely i know when i grew up it was letter nimoy with in search of oh, that I was the it. big influence for me i loved it, but, it was a great show. It was yeah it was, was, was that and sightings and then a few other shows but doctor who was always rock solid as well for great for storytelling yeah. and, and really a good show it was that and twilight zone Oh, were the two yeah, ones. The Outer Limits was wonderful. And do you remember? Yes. It called Cold Chat the Night Stalker with Darren McGavin. Yes. Oh, yep. I love yep. that. Love that as well. Absolutely great. Yeah, they don't make TV like they did. They don't. And over here we had, I don't know if you got it in the States, we had something called Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. And the Ooh. science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke. I mean, yeah. Yeah. A different, a different mystery each each week it was not unlike um 
It's not unlike uh, In Search Of. Sure. Were you X Files fan, Richard? I liked the quirkier episodes, like um, Quagmire and yeah. Hubbug and War of the Copper Phases. I didn't sure. like the ones that were just about blah blah grey aliens, blah blah conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Like that. I liked well, that's the thing. It. Yeah, I liked it better when they had Monster of the Week kind of stuff going on yeah. for uh, for for X Files. Yeah. You know, so that was that was their best. I'll be Alex. What what was yours? I mean, do you have anything that really influenced you? I mean, my <laughs> my favorite sci fi show growing up was Stargate. It, Stargate, Stargate Atlantis. Oh yeah, good stuff right there. And fellow Minnesotan was on there, Richard Dean Anderson, huh? Yeah, MacGyver. Yeah. Yep. So, so Richard, like, you know, coming off of Doctor Who, how did you transition to getting into, you know, like cryptozoology and, and you know, the, all of these other topics? Like, did well, you have a, a ex- life-changing experience? I became a zookeeper. Um, when I left school, I, I didn't go to university until much later. I was a mature student. Um, when I left school, I went straight into a youth training scheme at a place called Cross Zoo in the West Midlands in, in England, biggest collection of monkeys and apes in Britain. And I trained there for several years, and then I took over running a reptile house. And I, because uh, the reptiles have always been a big passion of mine, particularly crocodilians, that fascinate me. And I, I ran, ran a reptile house there, but the zoo was run back in those days by two old women, long since dead, called uh, Molly Badham and Natalie Evans. Um, Molly Badham was possibly the worst example of humanity I've ever come across, except for my ex. And um, <laughs> Except not, for your ex. <laughs> unbelievably spiteful uh, and nasty and petty, but she didn't know anything about animals because she and this other woman had started the zoo back in the 1960s when you didn't mm-hmm. have to have a license to start a zoo. You didn't have to know anything about any animals. Any old ducker could start a zoo if they'd got some money and some land. And lots of people back in the you know 50s and 60s, they started zoos in their backyards. And um, Toy Cross Zoo was quite a big zoo because they had a lot of money. And they surrounded themselves with people that knew a lot about animals. And then they yeah. took the credit for it. But in the time I was there, I, I saw 50 people leave. And um, you know, there's only so much abuse you can take until you snap. And one day I snapped and I turned on Molly Badham very badly indeed and told her exactly what I thought of her, where she could stick her job. And she was lucky I didn't have a bucket of shit in my hand because it would have gone straight over her head. <laughs> <laughs> enough was enough, right, Richard? You had enough. Yeah, and from then up, I was I, I was out hunting um, the Beast of Bodmin Moor once, which is a... Uh, uh, um, a mystery big cat. In, in Britain, we have many sightings of big cats like black leopards and pumas, yeah. which shouldn't be here. And they they originally came from um, the 1970s. Like I said before, anybody mm-hmm. can keep exotic animals. Harrods, the, the big department store yeah. in London, yeah. their, their pet department sold gorillas and, and lions. And after somebody was savaged by a lion, I think it was in Birmingham, um, the, the government brought in this thing called the Dangerous Wild Animals Act. So, yeah, as I say, it wasn't legal until like 1976. Yeah. I mean, that wasn't that long ago when you think about it. People were able to own lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Yeah. And until they're like, hey, you know, we can't be doing this anymore. You, you name it, yeah. And um, a lot of people, well, but, but you, had to, you had to pay a big license fee. You had to prove you could keep these things securely. Yeah. A lot of people just like, put them to moorlands and woodlands and let them go. And because sure. we destroyed all our big predators in Britain, we used to have wolves, bears, wolverine, lynx, all sorts of things, and they were all wiped out centuries ago. And uh, because there's no competition, and there's lots and lots of prey animals like deer and hares and rabbits these things thrive and what we're seeing now is the descendants of these original ones now there's a famous one called the beast of bodmin moor that's seen down in cornwall 
And I, I was on holiday looking for this beast. I was trying to trap mm-hmm. it with bait and, and things and, and try to get a photograph of it. And I came across this museum um, in a pub. There's a pub called the Jamaica Inn uh, out in, in Bodmin Moor. And they used to have this wonderful museum called Potter's Collection of um, what it's called, Potter, Potter's Museum of Curiosities. Okay. It was loads of stuffed animals like guinea pigs playing cricket and things, and frogs yeah. married, and squirrels having jewels. And this guy, this eccentric Victorian guy, had stuffed all these animals, and he'd also collected loads of weird stuff just to put on show. So you'd have a head of a man eating crocodile from India. And next to it, yeah. you'd have Maori axe. Then you have a model of a church made entirely out of pigeon feathers. That's really, and sad, sadly, the museum doesn't um, exist anymore. And the collection yeah. was split up and sold off. But whilst I was out there, you know. Everyone wants a good health plan. UCARE offers a variety of affordable plans for individuals and families at some of the lowest costs in the state. It's no wonder they're the number one plan on Minsure the last five years. See if you qualify for a subsidy today at Minsure.org. What's it like to build with CNM Home Builders? When we built our first house, we had absolutely no idea what we wanted in a house. It was challenging, but CNM made the process super easy. Our project manager, he was very, very good communicating with us and, and talking to us about stuff that may pop up or stuff we got to come look at and, and things like that. I recommend it to all of our friends to build because it is so fun and you just get to pick out everything. So CNM just makes it so easy to do. Visit cnmhomebuilders.com. Sure. Yeah, at this museum, I picked up a little magazine in the shop where they sell all the you know, books and things. Um, yeah. It was a magazine that had the Loch Ness Monster on the front. And it was, the magazine was called Animals and Men. And it wasn't as rude as it sounded. <clears throat> it was a magazine about cryptozoology published by this group called the Centre for Protein Zoology. So I wrote to them, and then I, I was living in Yorkshire in the north of England at the time. And um, I started writing letters to them, and I write, started writing articles for them, and I became the Yorkshire rep. And then I came down and visited this guy called John Downs and his then wife, who ran the, this organisation, the Centre for Fourteen Zoology, or mm-hmm. for short. And they said, you know, when you finish at university, come down here and, and be our zoological director. So when I finished at university, I um, went down to live in Exeter with John. Now, I, I always thought John Downs was this eccentric, really rich, eccentric English gentleman. Yeah. And he would be living yeah. in a mansion with, you know, great libraries and those those big globes of the world that you open up and they've got liquor in them and big leather bags. Yeah, living the high life is what you're saying. That's what I thought. When I got down to John's house, it was like this two up, two down hovel on a housing estate, and it owed more to uh, young ones than it did to the X Files. And, uh, I lived, <laughs> and then eventually, John inherited his his dad's cottage in, in North Devon, and that's where the the HQ of uh, the CFZ is now. But mm-hmm. since joining the CFZ as its zoological director, I've been all over the world looking for strange creatures. Um, I, I've been to every continent except Antarctica on, on the track of unknown animals like the orang pendek, the thylacine, giant anaconda, yeah. Mongolian deathworm, yeti, Russian almasty, all sorts of things. And I've had fantastic adventures. What do you, I got to ask you, Richard, what do you, what do you, what do you make a Bigfoot here in America's? And I know Bigfoot isn't really talked about in your neck of the woods, but over here it's huge. Do you believe it? Do you believe that there's a Bigfoot or yes. many of them? Yes, yes, absolutely. I believe in Bigfoot. I'll be far more surprised if it didn't exist than it did. There are mm-hmm. so many sightings. There are there's footprint evidence now that's been looked at by experts like Jeff Meldrum, Meldrum, and the guy that does. Uh, I've forgotten his name. The guy that was the FBI's um, fingerprint expert he's looked at the dermal ridges on them and above all the Patterson sure. Gimlin film I've worked with apes I've worked with gorillas chimpanzees or yeah. that's not a guy in a suit you can see the yeah. muscles moving underneath the hair 
Mm-hmm. You can mm-hmm. see when it curves around sideways, you can see that it's got a sloping skull. You've got the brow ridge and the skull slopes away acutely like it does in most apes and hominids you know from the, the fossil record. So a human in a costume, you wouldn't be able to fit it into that shape. Imagine a human yeah. head trying to fit into that shape because humans have upright foreheads. Mm-hmm. Apes and hominids have sloping foreheads. So a human head wouldn't fit in a mask like that unless the mask was too large so it would look Sure. Like something from a Mardi Gras, and the arms yep. are too long as well, far too long. And if someone was using arm extensions to make it look longer, then the elbows would be too high. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. About that says hoax to me. Everything about that says flesh and blood. Animals. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the only piece of footage out there. I mean, you know, the best piece of footage and one of the onlys, but. They can try to debunk it all they want to, and no one's been able to debunk this thing. In fact, every time they go to debunk it, it actually adds another dimension of believability to it rather than retracting from it because they did a recent 4K restoration of it, and that showed even more of the muscle mass. That showed even more of the fact that it is indeed a primate walking rather than a man in the suit. And there's just no way that it's, it's anatomically impossible, as you'd mentioned, to p- for a human being to pull that form off. Whenever they try and recreate it, it just looks like a guy in a monkey suit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're 110% right. Those that have tried to recreate it, it it's obvious it's a man in a monkey suit. And they could try as, uh, I mean, they've tried to use really high-end suits that Hollywood is would be using in movies. And it still looks... Mm fake when they try to recreate it because it is but they cannot recreate what's real and i think the same creature is found in places like tibet and the himalayas Mm. and parts of china i think it's one in the same animal one in the same Mm species in the same way you get brown bears in Asia and you get them in North America because they came across the land group. I think the same thing happened. I think the, the Sasquatch is the same species or a subspecies of the larger type of record. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think, think you're the, right. I think you're definitely think right on that. The tool use, the way that they will use tool, the way that they'll hurl rocks, kill prey, they'll use clubs. There have even been rare cases of them uh, using tree branches to spear fish so that they're tool users and that's one of the reasons that the skeptics will say oh people are mistaking bears well a bears don't walk habitually on their hind legs b they haven't got opposable thumbs so they can't pick up and hurl rocks or swing clubs c they've got flat bears have got long mm-hmm. dog-like snouts and the ears are on the top of the head so they remember Yeti and the Sasquatch have flat, ape-like yep. face. And they have, Yeti and Sasquatch, lastly, they have broad shoulders because bears are quadrupeds, like dogs and big cats and anything mm-hmm. on all fours. The scapula, the shoulder blades, will be flat against the body. But an upright walking creature like a human or a relic hominid have these broad shoulders because the scapula face out. So it's not a bear. The whole gotcha. bear is one of the most sure. I mean, skeptics in general, I find their arguments really feeble for most things. Really feeble. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. What do, what do you, you know, the sightings, though, I mean, a skeptic would say, yeah, but why no body? I mean, how do we account for no body? How do we account for... You know, sure, there's sightings, but there's very little evidence. I mean, these creatures must be super stealthy, Richard. I mean, they're, they're like the world's best hiding seek champion. Well, I think they survived by avoiding competition with modern man. I think they've evolved to be mainly nocturnal, live in places mm-hmm. far away from human habitation, and learn how to avoid it. But when something dies in a forest, the body's broken down really quickly by scavengers. Even things like rodents eat the bones for the, for the calcium. So you've seen these films where they, 
they do body farms where they see how long it takes for bodies to rot away. They they rot incredibly quickly, especially when they're mm-hmm. out of access to them. And people that go out into the wilderness, people have asked them, how many times have you seen a, a dead bear? And they say never or maybe once. Yeah. So that, the no body thing is an, another uh, objection that can easily be explained. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, look at the American black bear. Extremely stealthy. If it weren't for the fact they're easily baited, you would never know they're there. And the only thing with, with the North American situation that I, I do find a little odd is that no one's brought one in. A hunter hasn't brought one in because there are so many trigger, trigger happy gun nuts that get off on killing animals. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Why nobody brought one in? Mm-hmm. Sure. I know exactly what you mean. It's a totally different thing in Asia. Totally different. Because the human population is much lower, and most of them haven't got guns. And virtually yeah. none of them have cameras. Yeah. Yep. Very true. What do you think, Alex? Well, I'm just interested to hear, you know, you have that really unique perspective as you know being a you know that you were a zookeeper with all you know working with all these different species like what do you feel like you've you've taken away from that that you've been able to you know see things other people aren't seeing in like you know things like zoology well absolutely my, my specialization was reptiles but i work with a bit of everything and i worked closely with gorillas for a long time and we had big silverback gorilla called Joe. He was enormous. And when you get up close to him, you see how his muscles move, and you see the definition of his spine. They have a sort of blackish-gray fur. It has Mm -hmm. browny bits on it, and when you get up to the spine, you see there's a line that goes down the spine of of this darker fur. And Mm -hmm. people say, oh, I well." On the pack some gimmick film, I can, I can see the zipper line on the on the back of the suit. That's not. That's the line of the, the fur down the spine. If you knew what gorillas were like, if you got up close to gorillas, you understood how they look. It's very similar. And with, way, with the way the muscles work, I mean, I saw the, this big silverback. Where there was a massive tree in his enclosure, a massive dead tree on its side, which was there for them to climb on. And this thing was a 35, 40 feet long, and it was thick, and it had the roots at one end. Mm-hmm. So he sit with his back to it, and with his le- left hand, just cup his hand underneath, lift this tree off the ground three times in quick succession, and then move on again as if it was nothing. Jeez. <laughs> Talk about the power. <laughs> Holy man. There's one time, this was before I was, I was at this zoo, but there was one time... He got a, um, a a big rock. He found a big rock and threw it through the glass, which was supposed to be bulletproof. And he got out into uh, the uh, the passage where the public come in to look at the grooves through these big glass windows. And they got all the staff at one end and trying to hold the door shut. And at the other end, they've got a tractor on full throttle, trying to close these doors, keep him in. And he's charging up and down the corridor banging these doors, and he knocked all the staff over, pushed this tractor out of the way, and walked out, and there was a little boy standing in his way, and he just gently moved the boy out of the way, and went walking around the zoo, and in the end, the keeper just come and took his hand, and led him back again. Wow. Man, I mean, think of the power this animal, this creature possesses, and it chooses to be gentle at that moment, when it could have destroyed everybody in its path, had it chosen to. Well, I mean, that speaks to high intelligence and some compassion and, you know, a lot of things. Gorillas are pretty laid-back animals. You have to really make a gorilla angry. Uh, the big mm-hmm. no-no is staring at them because that, that's a challenge. But generally, they're pretty laid-back, unlike chimpanzees, which are unbelievably vicious. If that was a yeah. chimpanzee that I got out, it would probably kill somebody. Damn. Um, we've, we've all uh, heard the stories of the that chimpanzee Travis, which ate the woman's face off and tore yeah, the door. That's right. That was brutal. Then there's the, the other one, the other one, uh, Mojo, that was sent to the uh, 
the sanctuary, and when his owners came with a birthday cake, when the other chimps got jealous, broke out and attacked and mauled the owner, and sort of ripped his face off and ate his buttocks, ripped his genitals off. Jeez. Chimpanzees are one of the few animals I have an active dislike of. So if you see a chimp in the wild, you better get running. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are cases in the wild where they kill people as well. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm not going to meet a gorilla. Man. That, so, that, you know, you, oh, go ahead, Alex. Oh, I was just going to say, so, you know, it sounds like one of the things you really bring to the table is, you know, something like, for example, you were just talking about the Patterson footage that you're able to, you know, some skeptic might blindly say, oh, well, that looks fake, but you're able to, compare that to your experiences with real, you know, with real apes and, and see the commonality there and mm. see that almost as another source of, um, you know, evidence. Well, the skeptics can say as much as they like, they can say, I can say, oh, well, we, we know he had sketches and drawings of Bigfoot that looked very like that mm-hmm. beforehand. And we know that, um, uh, we know that somehow he got the film developed really quickly quicker than he should have been able to at the time this that, and none of that changes that you couldn't fit a human being into that shape yeah in a suit because it's the wrong shape it would have to be the freakiest human being it have to be seven feet tall have arms down to its knees and a great sloping sloping skull and it's mm-hmm. very true very true you'd have to find almost a a circus performer level freak to, to be able to do that. If one does exist, those features and there's none that I'm aware of that would have even to begin with those kind of features. I mean, even Andre, the giant, the giant, Andre, the giant, the wrestler yeah. was shorter than what this would have been. Yeah. And also it, he had a bit of a brow ridge. Hi, I'm a UCare simplifier, which means I make your individual and family plan process nice and simple. Let's go through it step by step. Step one, go to minsure.org. Step two, see if you qualify for a subsidy. Step three, say EGADS. UCARE has some of the lowest rate plans in the state with a ton of benefits and a super large network so I can keep my doctor. Well, you don't have to say EGADS. Just trying to bring it back. UCARE, people-powered health plans. Go to minsure.org to enroll today. What's it like to build your dream home with CNM Home Builders? We knew that we were just building to get out of renting and we knew that we were going to build again. We talked to CNM Real Estate side of it and see what the market was at and everything and, and we decided to go forward and build another host of CNM. We didn't think it would be just two short years later, but it's just the way it happened and we're so thankful. The market got good and we sold our Harrison and made a good profit and we're able to build this house. It made everything so stress-free. See what they can do for you at c&mhomebuilders.com. Uh, yep. But he didn't have the sloping skull. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. If so you, what, If you're yeah. you dressed up as Bigfoot in a $6 million man, I do. Like Bigfoot, like give him this weird big Jesus beard for some reason and long hair. It doesn't look like any description of Bigfoot. And he, he looked just like a, a man in a silly suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You, you're. Uh, I'm looking at those pictures right now. Now you said I googled it really quick. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Six million dollar man in that in that movie or that TV show. That that that's funny. That was funny. I mean, that's Hollywood trying to do its best to create back in those t- days. And this is after the Patterson film. This was in the seventies. So technology had even gone further with ape suits, and that's the best they can muster. Is that? Hey, it looks like uh, the legend of Foggy Creek. I think I did a good job in, of that because they kept it in the shadows. Apparently, yeah. that they just got a gorilla costume and brought some wigs and stuck the hair onto it to make the hair longer. But, but because they kept it in the shadows, it looked really creepy. Yeah, yeah, it was the unknown kind of creepy going on. Yeah. But we never actually saw the creature very many times. But I do remember uh, watching that movie. I think there's a scene where the hand reaches through the window, right? Yeah. Uh, after this lady. Oh, my God. It was so Planet of the Apes looking. It was great. I mean, it was just funny. Yeah, well, the guy that did the Planet of the Apes, I've forgotten his name now, but the guy that did, and he got, he got an award for it, he said 
looking at the, the Patterson gym and things. I couldn't do that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're right. You you, you are right. And, and uh, so I gotta ask you, Richard, what 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 do you think of like Dog Man? I mean, some of these modern cryptids that have come along out of nowhere. Well, like, the you know about it's stuff like the Beast of Bray Road and the Dog Man and things like that. These modern day werewolves they bear no resemblance to the original werewolves of European legend. I've mm-hmm. seen you know from like the 12th century onwards, up until the, the 17th century, there were stories of werewolves in Europe, um, particularly in Germany. Mm-hmm. But they, these are human beings that were supposed to transform themselves entirely yeah. to wolves, and the wolf would not look any different from any other ordinary wolf, except for maybe by weird behaviour. And the stories yeah. go that, that it was due to packs with the devil, who the sorcerers who would give you um, uh, a wolf skin jacket or a wolf skin belt. When you put it on, you would transform into the wolf so you could go out and seek human prey. I mean, this may have started, the original werewolf may have started through rabies because a rabid wolf would be much more aggressive and much bolder. And if it bit a human being and the human survived, then they would get rabies too. So it would be like, mm-hmm. earth on. So the modern day werewolves, they look like the, the werewolves from films. They, 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 they do. They do. What people describe, they describe seeing a canine uh, looking creature. Well, and you know the story, standing on two legs, walking around. And that to me sounds more like American Werewolf in London, not, you know, mm. you know a movie, movie one, like you'd said. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A movie type werewolf. Yeah, because it's, it's started the first modern werewolf movie. Well, the first werewolf movie ever fe- featured an actual wolf. It was a um, Native American transforming into a wolf. That's an old silent one from about 1912. Mm-hmm. But the first modern werewolf one in the 1930s was the Werewolf of London, predating um, Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman for several years. Yeah. And that was the first one that depicted these sort of hairy upright like werewolves you think of today. I always think Lon Chaney in in the in Universe is the Wolfman. He looks more like a Yorkshire Terrier than a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it does, and I always wondered why the Wolfman, Lon Chaney Jr., would strangle people. He's a wolf. Doesn't he supposed to eat people? Why is he yeah. strangling people? Yeah. <laughs> that made no sense to me whatsoever. I'm like, oh, a wolf that likes to strangle people. But a lot of the things we think of as purely mythological or purely legendary, there are still sightings of them today. And one of the things that interests me most are uh, the legends of dragons, because the dragon is the king of the monsters. It's been mm-hmm. traced back at least 40,000 years, dragon legends. And they, they appear in every single culture on Earth, every culture on Earth, cultures that never met all have legends of these gigantic reptiles. And there are still sightings of dragon-like creatures that persist, persist into the modern day. A few years back, I was in West Africa, and I was um, investigating reports of this thing called a Minkinanka. And mm-hmm. they're terrified of it over there. They say it's a type of dragon that lives in the swamps. And it has this horse-like head, venomous bite, a great crest on its head long body with silvery green scales, snake-like body. Some of the reports say it's got wings like a bat and these four clawed legs. It lives in the swamp and they say, they believe if you see it, you'll die within five years. And we met a guy who said his uncle had seen one years ago in this swamp and they abandoned the village. They were so frightened, everybody abandoned the village. So we went with a native guide in the sky to the swamp. Um, yeah. The guy got so frightened he wouldn't even look at the swamp, let alone go into the swamp. So he had to interview him when he was hiding behind a bush. And our native guy went about half. Wait, wait, m- hold on, Richard. I gotta stop you. You interviewed the guy while he was hiding behind a bush. Yeah, he went and hid behind a bush. He was so scared. <laughs> I mean, how, how, how does, did you have a hard time conversing with a bush? Like, hey. 
<laughs> it, was, it was pretty surreal. Well, how are you? From behind this bush. How um, are you? I, how are you feeling during this whole thing? I felt like I was in a Monty Python sketch, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Why are you in the bushes? Come on out. Then the, the, the guy, he's the native guy, he went about a quarter of a mile into the, the swamp with us, and then he, he lost his nerve and ran back out. And we went on and found the abandoned village. And they, they were so frightened by this guy's story of seeing this thing that they, they um, just upped and left the village. And I would talk to another guy who said his, his grandfather had seen it just after World War Two. in these lakes that are now reservoirs. And they, they, they were used for pumping water into Banjul, the capital of the Gambia. And once again, the description was the same. It was, and it was this colossal serpentine reptile. And he said that he, he, his grandfather died after seeing it, whether it was from fright or something like that. But they, they erected mirrors around the lakes because they, they thought that it would frighten the dragon away, that it would see its own reflection and, and it would drive it away. But the weird thing was that previous year I was in Mongolia looking for the death word. But in Mongolia, yeah. we also heard stories of these great serpentine dragons with scales that shine like mirrors and uh, we heard one of uh, a story of one coming up out of a well and people had seen this thing leaving the well and at the time because this, this story happened many years ago it was it was during the, the soviet socialist period and the, the, the local communist party official you know, said that this is a religious story, we don't allow that. So him and two of his mm -hmm. colleagues poured oil down as well. And so the story goes that within a week, two of the men were dead, and the other one was struck barren. Damn. So the belief in it is still there. And another story we heard from much more recently, just from a few years ago, was about a doctor. And in Mongolia, instead of counties, they have these things called sum. And they have sum mm -hmm. centers, which is where the main... Uh, the main conurbation of people are. But a sum can be the size of a small country or, or mm -hmm. the size of a small American state. And um, sure. we were told by, we were in a, a, a place called Borgam Sum, and the, the mayor of Borgam Sum told us that a few years previously, um, a traveling doctor had been there and he went to draw water out of a well. And he said he saw a dragon coiled up in the well. And he said it had this horse-like face and a great serpentine body and green scale. So these... Wow. So these, he saw this dragon, is what you're saying. He says yeah. he saw it. Yeah, and this was a doctor. It wasn't a superstitious person. An educated man. Yeah. Huh. Damn. And, and so, it, but he lived past five years, right? Yeah, but this was in Mongolia. The idea. Okay, that, okay, uh, different dragon. Never mind. Yeah. The idea that you will die within five years is a piece of superstition from um, West Africa, from the Gambia and the surrounding Okay. Country. And they okay, blame sure. it a road accident or someone goes missing in the forest or there's a flood. They blame it all on the Minkin Anka, which is a sort of bogeyman. It becomes sort of a bogeyman to them. Huh. But even in even in England, um, back in the seventies, there was theory. There was a theory by a guy um, called uh, F. W. Holiday, and uh, uh, this guy he wrote he wrote a book called The Great Orm of Loch Ness, about the Loch Ness. Mm -hmm. And then in his second book, he changed his tune completely. The second book is called The Dragon and the Disc, and he believed that the Loch Ness monster and phenomena like it were not flesh and blood animals, but they were um, they were supernatural in nature, and that it was literally a dragon, a malevolent supernatural serpentine creature. And he got a, a friend of his, the Reverend Dr. Donald Ormond, who was a, an exorcist. And there's a great book, it's hard to get hold of, it's called Devil Hunter. It's a great book about okay. guy. Uh, Dr. Donald Orman, who was an exorcist. And he was supposed to have exorcised one of the phantom black dogs. Um, he was supposed to have exorcised um, a youth he believed was possessed by a vampire. Um, 
an oriental idol that's supposed to have had some malevolent air about it. But he also exercised Loch Ness. He went to Loch Ness to exercise it because this guy, a few years before, he had been in Norway and he'd encountered a sea serpent in one of the fjords in Norway. And the captain of the boat he was in said that this isn't an ordinary serpent. This is more like the serpent from the Garden of Eden. It's supernatural. Um, okay. It's wow. And it's malevolent. So he got this idea in his head that this was a, a, a supernatural entity. So he tried to exercise Loch Ness and he, he went to the four corners of Loch Ness and the middle to do this exorcism. And uh, it didn't work because people still see the Loch Ness monster. I was going to say, they're still seeing the Loch Ness monster, right? Eh? But the, the interesting thing is that um, the famous uh, Victorian and Edwardian um, magician, uh, Alastair Crowley, Yep. He brought a house there called Boleskine House on the shore. Yep. And he brought it deliberately because of its architecture. He wanted to carry out this very long ritual called the Ritual of Abramelin's Age, who was supposed to have been a wandering Egyptian mystic. And it was to um, create guardian angels, but also to bring down and find four spirits um, and one of those spirits was uh, Leviathan, which in biblical terms is a great sea dragon. Yeah. And wow. uh, apparently it went wrong and the whole thing was a disaster and his servants went mad. One of them tried to murder him. Uh, another one tried to strangle his wife and ended up in prison. And uh, he had to leave the Leskin house. And then later it was taken over by... Uh, uh, Jimmy Page, the musician. That's right, Led Zeppelin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, the caretaker there said there was all sorts of weird things happening, bizarre poltergeist outbreaks. And one day, one, one evening, uh, he said there was something battering against his door, like some huge animal that was snorting and growling. And he said he, he had the feeling it was utterly malevolent and it, it didn't dissipate into, into the dawn. And recently it's caught fire and burnt down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when Jimmy Page owned that. Years ago, I interviewed Jimmy Page. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about guitars, the music at that time, stuff like that. But I slipped that into the interview. And he was talking about, yeah, he he, he owned the house. And, and, and uh, you know, he was into the mystical arts back then. This is the 70s, you know, back when Led Zeppelin were at their height. And, you know, he he bought this house. And, and uh he he talked about uh, the strange happenings that he witnessed in the house as well. So it, it, not only did the caretaker do it, but he witnessed this black dog for himself. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Well, just behind it is a little church. And in 1969, in this churchyard, they found an altar that had been set up with red candles and a conch and um, what looked like offerings of lotus leaves. But... There was also an altar cloth, and on it, in Turkish script, was the word for dragon. What's it like to build your dream home with CNM Home Builders? We knew that we were just building to get out of renting, and we knew that we were going to build again. We talked to CNM Real Estate side of it and see what the market was at and everything, and, and we decided to go forward and build another host of CNM. We didn't think it would be just two short years later, but it's just the way it happened and we're so thankful. The market got good and we sold our Harrison and made a good profit and we're able to build this house. It made everything so stress-free. See what they can do for you at candmhomebuilders.com. Like someone would do a ritual. And that's not, so, the, only, it's not the only place. There's a, a strange little pub um, in a place called South Shields on the, the northeast coast of, of Britain. And this pub mm -hmm. is built into a cliff face. And the only way you can get to it is going down by a lift. So let's get to a mm -hmm. lift down to this place called Marsden Grotto. And it was first built by a guy called Blaster Jack, who was an old quarry man in uh, the late 18th, early 19th century. And he extended these caves and opened a tea room there on it and built a home there and he lived quite happily the rest of his life and he, he, he said he helped out smugglers as well 
But after he died, it was taken on by this other guy, and he opened it up as a pub. It, it remained as a pub ever since then. And it's still a pub today, and it's got part of the old Lampton Castle in it. It's got a carving of the Lampton Worm on it, which was a gigantic serpentine dragon sure. that terrorised the area at the time of the Crusades. Now, the weird thing is that all along that coast, from um, Marsden Bay up to Lindisfarne, Holy Isle, there are sightings of a sea serpent called uh, the Shoney. Now, a friend of mine, a guy called Mike Hallowell, he's a Fortean investigator, he's, he's since retired real health. Um, but he was investigating the whole background to Marsden Grotto, and he, he stumbled across the, the stories of this sea dragon called the Shoney. And mm -hmm. apparently, when the area was under the Dane law, at the time of the Vikings, the Vikings were so frightened of this sea dragon that they would make offerings to human sacrifice. They would tie someone up, slit their throat, and they'd throw them over the boat in the hope that the creature would devour the body and not attack the boat. And over a time, it became like a cult, more like a, a worship or a veneration rather than, you know, tactics to stop it attacking the boat. And so the story goes that this continued after the time of the Viking, and Scandinavian sailors still did this. And that occasionally bodies would wash up all along that coast, sometimes half eaten, but always tied up with a throat slit. And the ones, that, the, the ones that washed up in Marsden Bay, they used the pub cellar as a, an impromptu um, more to lay them out until the authorities came and took the bodies away. Now, according to Mike's research, the last body was found in Marsden Bay in 1928. So if there's any truth to that story, then there was a dragon worship cult in England making human sacrifices well into the 20th century. Yeah, I was going to say, really, it wasn't that here's, long, less than 100 years ago. Here's the kicker. Whilst he was investigating this, Mike claims he had a number of threatening phone calls telling him to drop it because he knew what was good for it. And don't go any further with it. Which makes him wonder is there some vestige of the cult still there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He claims to have seen the creature himself when he was driving with his family along a cliff top road. He saw lots of other cars had stopped and they were looking at something. So they stopped mm -hmm. and they looked out of the sea and they saw this great pump back, bigger than a, a car, come out of the water. And he said it was sort of nut brown <coughs> with a, a darker streak on his eyes. It wasn't a whale, it wasn't a basking shark, and he could say a great long neck and a tail coming off it under the water, and he was convinced that that was the Shoney, the sea dragon. So, is there any truth to that tale? I don't know. It's, it's a, it sounds like a, a script to a Hammer horror movie, and it's one of the weirdest cases I've, I've ever come across. But in a that is odd. No longer investigating, he's, he's retired real hell. So that's where the story stands. That's nuts. That's crazy. You're right. That is a strange story. I mean, in comparison to that, most of the things I look for are, you know, fairly. I mean, not. Theology. Don't, yeah. Richard, don't get me wrong. It's not as weird as the Bush story, but yeah. it's still weird. <laughs> so, I mean, when you were looking for that thing, I mean, weren't you afraid for your life? What, when I was looking for the Ninky Nanka? No, no not, not in the least. Uh, I've never been afraid of any of the creatures that I've been looking for. I mean, I've been stalked by a tiger in Sumatra. I've been attacked by a cobra in Africa. Um, I've fallen off a cliff in Russia, slipped down the side of a mountain on ice uh, in Russia, um, nearly got swept away by uh, rapids in Russia. Russia really had it in for me. Um, but I've, never, <laughs> I've never been afraid of the creatures. The worst thing on, on expeditions is bad food and bureaucracy at airports and customs and things. Getting in and out of a country and getting to a country, that's the hard bit, I find. 
Sure. Yeah, the red tape, the bureaucratic and political red tape. Yeah. What yeah, you- I've heard that before. So, so once do you, you believe it? Oh, go ahead, guys. Oh, no, I was, I was just going to say, so once you get to a place where you could be eaten alive, that's when you feel... <laughs> You're, you're just like, all right, I'm through airport security. <laughs> That's right. The, yeah. the worst is behind me. Yeah. The waiting around, the signing forms, the take it, turning out your pockets. Goodness me. Yeah, that would be the worst. You're you're right. There's nothing scarier than than uh, government agencies. Let me tell you right now, nothing yeah. scary, especially you're traveling. I'm fine when I'm in the jungle or up a mountain or in a desert. I hear you. Hey, do you, do you believe in dragons, Richard? I mean, do, yeah. you, do you think the fire-breathing yeah, so dragons? I, I do believe in dragons because of the universality of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's more than one thing involved in, in dragon lore and dragon legend. It's a, it's a very rich very rich tapestry of different things. I've, I've written a couple of books on, on dragons. Um, so do you think, uh, question though, I mean, are they are they kind of like what we would think of, like fire-breathing dragons, or are these a little more understated? Maybe they don't fly. Maybe they're more like a snake. Well, there's, there's, there's different types of dragons, but the, the classic fire-breathing wing dragon of... Um, ancient law and, and dragons have four legs true dragons have four legs and two wings not how they're p- portrayed in most films with only two legs and two wings that technically is a wise and not a dragon those things i think are paranormal in nature i think mm-hmm. either interdimensional or, or, or paranormal because if those things were flying around they'd be tearing fighter planes out of the sky they'd be attacking people they'd be turning up on radar i think I think there's something that slips through from maybe from another dimension for a short while. I mean, as mm-hmm. recently as 2007 in um, Aconto Falls in Wisconsin, there was a mass sighting of a dragon. White, they said it was white. Um, it was a group of, initially, a group of people had come out from a concert and were in a um, car park and they saw a ball of fire shoot across the sky and they said the fire was orange and trailing blue behind it and then they said they saw this enormous flying animal with bat like wings enormous the size of a plane and it had four legs which it held up against its body a long tail with a fin at the end a long neck with a sort of wedge shaped head and they saw it spitting out these balls of fire and then later when one of these witnesses went back to his family and told them they laughed at him until they saw it as well. They went out into the garden and they saw the same thing flying around. Now, if that was flying around all the time, it would be on YouTube. Everybody would see it and photograph it. So either everybody sure. a mass hallucination and they all hallucinated the same thing, or they saw something that was, for want of a better word, paranormal mm-hmm. in nature. Now, if you were going to make up a story about a dragon, you would probably say that it, it was it would be green or or it would be red or something like that. You wouldn't initially think of white as a, as a yeah. dragon. But on the other side of the world, there was a um, a guy, I think it was an American guy, um, called David Nardillo, who was in Osaka teaching English. And he reported seeing a dragon. And his description mm-hmm. was the same, white, four-legged, bat-like wings. And it came up out of a, um, a pool. He saw it came up, come up out of a pool. So they're all liars, they're all mad, or they're seeing something supernatural. But also, you True. Add, add to that, you know, there are giant lizards, giant crocodiles, giant snakes, probably undiscovered species of reptile. Michele and Bembe from the Congo, the, the so called Congo dinosaur, if it exists, I think it's a giant monitor lizard. Because mm-hmm. we, we know that giant lizards exist in Australia. There was one called. Um, uh, Varanus priscus, or it used to be called Medellania. And um, that thing is a, a like Komodo dragon, but scaled up to the size of a bus, a lizard the size of a bus with a venomous bite. That's yeah. A terrifying thought. And today there are stories coming out of New Guinea 
<coughs> of lizards several times bigger than the Komodo dragon that I've seen in, in the wilds of New Guinea. Fantastic place, New Guinea. I've never been to it. It's one of the places I most want to go. There's a, also stories of a gigantic sacred crocodile that was venerated by um, natives there that believe it's a water spirit and it protects mm -hmm. them. It's probably chasing all the other rival male crocodiles out of the area. That's another one of my interests, giant crocodiles. There are stories of all over the world of, of far, far bigger crocodiles than anything recorded by science. Oh, man, yeah, there's some giant crocodiles up there, especially in Australia. You get the saltwater crocodiles. They, they, can, be, they can grow to be huge sizes. Yeah, and, of course, in the States, we have some alligators that can get pretty big as well. Yeah, there's a Nile crocodile in Africa, the famous bush star, who's at least 23 feet long. Someone tried to kill him with a machine gun. All it did was put a few dents in his scale. He's threatened <laughs> to, to have eaten 300 people. He lives in Lake Tanganyika, and he's achieved this legendary status. That's an interesting thing, that when an animal uh, is so feared or, or so venerated by a local population, it takes on this mythological legendary status. It becomes something sure. more than an animal. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. I mean, it becomes lore, and then it grows from there, and then it becomes... You, you know, how many misidentifications or, or, or sightings of giant creatures that are just abnormal for their area have gone on to become cryptos, you know, I mean, paranormal animals. Yeah, you know, giant, I would imagine quite a few. Giant anaconda in South America, which I went looking for a few years back. But unfortunately, we went during the worst drought that the natives could ever remember. So we couldn't get along where the rivers were so low, we couldn't get along into the remote lakes where the huge sure. on this was supposed to be do you remember that photo a few years ago of that green anaconda that they had in the floor of the uh, um, jungle oh it was what? like yeah. huge supposed to be about 10 meters yeah I yeah. yeah yeah it was just crazy long and just to think something like that exists it's just you know mm. frighteningly scary is what it is well, they used to call them. They used to call them the Manatoro, which means the bull killer, because they said back in the time of where the, the gauchos were, were like the South American version of cowboys, you know, cattle ranchers. They say these things got so huge they could grab a full-grown steer, pull it into the water, squeeze it to death, and then swallow it whole. Jeez. No, oh, man. Can you imagine that, Alex? Hanging out, enjoying your favorite day at the beach. Next thing you know, you got that. So, on. what are you most curious about right now? Hmm. Maybe he's thinking about that. <laughs> it would appear that. Uh, Alex, are you still with me? That is so strange, everybody. Everything is dropped for whatever reason. And so I'm going to go ahead and hook that right back up. Get everybody in here. And then uh, uh, add everybody back in. I don't know what the heck's going on. No idea what the heck is going on but uh we're gonna go ahead and get everybody added back into this call but great conversation though we're having i mean it's 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 just amazing some of the animals out there that that are uh, that he has explored and been around and dealt with it's just crazy i mean you know some of these these creatures though that have be, you know became bigger than life What's it like to build your dream home with CNM Home Builders? We knew that we were just building to get out of renting and we knew that we were gonna build again. We talked to CNM real estate side of it and see what the market was at and everything and, and we decided to go forward and build another host of CNM. We didn't think it would be just two short years later, but it's just the way it happened and we're so thankful. The market got good and we sold our Harrison and made a good profit and we're able to build this house. It made everything so stress free. See what they can do for you at cnmhomebuilders.com. This is a St. Jude moment. Ashton was a high level athlete and in a, an instant, your world flips. 
and your healthy five-year-old competitive cheerleader has a brain tumor. And the physician was like, your best option is St. Jude. Receiving treatment that was life-saving for our child and knowing that that treatment would be of no cost to us was a huge weight lifted. Learn more at stjude.org through just growing that size stuff like that so excuse me while this rings because we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna hook everything back up for some reason the system crashed but we can definitely take care of that and hey guys i am hey. back yes i am right back at you we had a momentary glitch it's okay sorry are you recording again Joel? we are we never stopped okay perfect we never stopped so, yep, we're still going, going, going. And when we left, uh, Alex had asked, what's interesting you now? I mean, what are you into? What intrigues you, sir? Well, there's two things that I'm most associated with and the two that I believe are most likely to exist are the Tasmanian wolf or thylacine and the orang pendek. With the orang pendek, it's a, a short but powerfully built, dark-haired, upright walking ape from Sumatra. The Indonesian island of Sumatra. I've been over there five times now looking for it. I've found footprints, handprints, we've got hair that's been analysed by an expert called Lars Thomas from the University of Copenhagen, and he says it's a elusive primate, related to the orangutan, but not the Sumatran orangutan, but something different. I've talked to so many witnesses, dozens and dozens of witnesses. I've heard it calling in the forest, I've been very close to it. I've never actually seen it. And one of my colleagues, Dave Archer, actually saw it in a tree and he said it had a startlingly human looking face, a dark fur like a mountain gorilla, and it was about five feet tall, very barrel chested, powerful looking. And it climbed down out of the tree when it knew it was being watched and walked away on two legs like a man. So that, wow. we think it's a ground dwelling relative to the orangutan. It, as recently as 2017, a new species of orangutan was identified in the mark for the, the Papanuli orangutan. So we think this is a new type of orangutan with dark fur rather than ginger fur, and it walks on the forest floor. And I think it's very close to being discovered, so I'm hoping to get back out there again and get mm -hmm. back. And the other one is uh, we use this as a Tasmanian wolf or thylacine as our logo at the CFC. It's a flesh eating marsupial. Uh, that looks like a wolf or a dog, but has tiger-like stripes along its back. But it's a, it's a marsupial. Its closest living relative is a, is a creature called a numbat. But okay. This animal, and it lived right across Australia, New Guinea, and Tasmania. It's supposed to have died out on the mainland uh, a couple of thousand years ago, maybe through diseases brought by dingoes when they introduced dingoes nobody knows for sure what it died out on the mainland and in new yeah. guinea but there are still sightings and um, it persisted until the 30s in um, tasmania when europeans first got over to tasmania in the early 19th century they wiped out the tasmanian EU, they wiped out the tasmanian aborigines that shot them like you know they were shooting rabbits, and um, when the Tasmanian wolf started to attack their sheep, they, they put a bounty on it. And in about 100 years, something like 2,000 of them were killed, and then there was a population crash at the turn of the last century. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also an outbreak of sarcoptic mange that went through the population. And it was thought that the last one died in Hobart Zoo in about 1936. But since then, there have been over 4,000 sightings of them, including by a park ranger and a zoologist, a zoologist called Hans Narding, who saw one in 1982, one 20 feet away. Now, I've been over there three times, and I've talked to witnesses, mm -hmm. including a guy who's a government licensed shooter. He goes out and kills feral cats. He's seen it twice. I've talked to a guy and his wife who own an arboretum, they saw one from a car running alongside of the road, and there were other cars stopping and watching this thing. So it was a, a mass sighting, mass witness case. Um, so many people have seen this thing, and none of them have access to flying. 
they all work with, they're all happy to talk about it, but they don't want you to reveal exactly where they've seen the creature because they're worried yeah. about people in the field. And there was a, uh, a scientist called Dr. Henry Nix, and he developed a computer program called BioClim. And BioClim was a research tool for zoologists. And what you did was program everything you knew about a certain mm -hmm. area into a, into a computer, and then everything you know about the animal you wanted to study. And then it would match the two up, the habitat and the habitat of the animal. And it would predict sure. where within this region it was most likely to be found. So if you were, say, you wanted to study white rhino within Botswana, it would tell you where the best places to find white rhino. So as an mm -hmm. exercise, he tried this with Tasmania and the Tasmanian wolf, and he found out that there was something like a 98% matchup between where the BioClim program was predicting thylacine should be if they were still alive and where people were actually seeing it. So he was convinced that the thylacine is still around. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it's still alive and it's still around. I mean, you had two people of uh, a trained people see it. Yeah. Um, you know? Reports from New Guinea as well. They call it Dobsonga. In, in New Guinea, in the highlands of New Guinea, and they say it comes down from the mountains. They say it looks like a dog with stripes down its back. They won't hunt it because it's taboo. It comes and takes yeah. their livestock, kills the livestock. And it mm -hmm. sounds like a dog down in Richard, I got to ask you, what do you make of the El Chupacabra here in the States? I mean, you know, well, for a long time, the goat sucker's been running around. It's a, essentially a media creation. Yeah. I, I think you might be right on that one. Yeah. My friend John Downs went over to, I've been over two or three times to Puerto Rico and Mexico and the southern states on the track of Chupacabra. And he said that the so called um, exsanguinations and killings of goats and things in Puerto Rico are the work of mongooses, which were introduced to the island in Victorian times. He grew up in mm -hmm. Hong Kong, where you get mongooses, and he said he's seen the bite marks on livestock killed by mongooses, and they're exactly the same as the ones in Puerto Rico. And he said he yeah. also saw a, a chicken, a dead chicken, and he said he saw a great line of ants going up into this chicken's cloaca and stripping it bare from the inside. So all these Jeez. animals having their their organs taken. They're almost certainly taken by scavengers like ants. Makes sense. Jeez. So what do you what do you think these things are? I mean, you know, like some of the supernatural stuff. Do you think they're demons? Do you think they're from different dimensions? What I mean, this is all this stuff, including dragons. Well, it's it, all about your cultural background. If you're from a religious background, call them demon or jinn or raksashas. Um, but that's just a name for something, something we don't understand for the frightened of. I think some of these weird things, like the, the owl man being reported from Cornwall over here, and the moth man and things like that, and weird stuff like dragon and the crude fiber in there. But, uh, uh, interdimensional things. Um, I've been told independently by two Muslims that jinn, which are supposed to be fire spirits in Islam, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be created from smokeless fire, which you could translate in modern terms as energy. They, they are supposed to inhabit this other dimension and we can't usually see them and they can't usually see us but sometimes they can come over, or vice versa. They can slip through to our world, or we can slip through to theirs. Sure. And they say they come in certain forms. They're, there are ones that look like dragons. There are ones that look like big, hairy apes. There are ones that look like huge black dogs with glowing eyes. There are ones that look like monstrous birds. And there are ones that look like huge black cats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much what people report when they're seeing monsters. I, re I came up with a theory years before this was told to me. I came up with a theory called Global Monster Template. 
And it was when I was hunting giant snakes called Nagas in Thailand. And I was in a sculpture park because they were making a documentary and they wanted to film some of these sculptures. And they had sculptures of the Naga, this giant snake with a crest on its head. And uh, a creature, half man, half bird, called the Garuda. And the Singa, which is, is supposed to be a, um, a, a type of supernatural lion that lives in the jungle. I mean, the nearest real lions are in India, in thousands of miles away. But I thought, wow, this is just like Cornwall in England, where they've got legends of um, legends of sea serpents. Um, sure. Morgar, the Cornish sea serpent. And they've got the owl man, seen in Cornwall as well. And they've got these, these weird big cats. And I got to thinking that all over the world, you get the same kind of monsters. You get monstrous reptiles like dragons and giant snakes and things. You get hairy giants, you get little people, goblins and things like that. You get monstrous birds, monstrous dog-like creatures like werewolves and black dogs, mysterious cats. Uh, and I thought, hang on a minute, it's all ringing the bell. And I thought, mm -hmm. cast your mind back a couple of million years to the plains of East Africa when our Australopithecine ancestors were coming down out of the tree to exploit new food sources like um, carrion. <coughs> they would have been in danger from a lot of animals. They would have yeah. been by, by crocodiles and pythons. We know that birds of prey, uh, like the martial eagle, took them down. There were African hunting dogs, which would have killed them. There were leopards and lions, which would have preyed on them. And there were other types of primates. There were other types of astrolopithecine, some bigger, some smaller. And there were giant baboons as well. So it's mm -hmm. like all of these monsters from the Global Monster Template are all sort of weird echoes, if you like, of the things that we were in competition with on the planet. Yeah. So I thought, well, what if we hold these ancient fears uh, in our subconscious? And that sure. certain circumstances, the collective subconscious of human human beings, the gestalt, if you will, and mm -hmm. monsters. Now, that's not to say there are not real flesh and blood monsters, but are flesh and blood in the same way that you and I are flesh and blood. And yeah, yeah, you, I know what you're saying. Echoes of the past. Yeah, but there's this other type, this other type, which are created as thought forms or tulpas. Now the idea of a tulpa is from Tibetan um, mythology and you're su supposed to under with intense concentration with mm -hmm. lots of training you're supposed to be able to mentally create something that other people can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there are a number of people that claim to have been able to do this. Oh, yeah, thought forms, yeah. Tulpa's thought forms, I mean, look at the Philp experiment, you know, and they created the their Philp own. The experiment is a classic. Is a yeah. Classic. And um, there was a guy uh, called Pranik Kluski. Um, I think he was around about the time of the First World War. He was a Polish medium uh, in Britain, and he mm -hmm. Creatures in, during seances, a huge bird that looked like a nightjar that sat on his head, what looked like a huge lioness that would lick the, the, the hands of the people sitting there, a huge black dog, and what looked like what they called a picanthropus, uh, which was like an ape man, which was this shambling, hairy creature that was supposed to be strong enough to lift someone up in a chair. Mm -hmm. with, on hand, it was like he was tapping into the global monster template and he was creating these archetypes, maybe not willingly, but subconsciously from the collective subconscious of the people in the same. Sure, sure, makes well, sense. I mean, you know, we, we know for a fact you put enough intention to something, you can will it to be true, yeah. And, um, I mean. If we, we think about Bigfoot for a minute, uh, <clears throat> Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest as a real flesh and blood animal makes sense, mm -hmm. perfect sense. Bigfoot, when it's seen 
you know, in the farmyards of somewhere like Iowa. <laughs> yeah. Alongside UFOs and alongside poltergeist outbreaks and alongside sightings of mysterious cats, then it starts to look less like a relic hominid than something more like something supernatural. Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, it, it's because it's in places it just doesn't belong to be. Yeah, I mean, and if we go back to lake monsters like Loch Ness and Loch Murrah and a lot of the Irish locks, I think what's mostly in there are gigantic eels. Enormous mm -hmm. eels. Just very, very big fish. But then you have these weirder cases, like the George Spicer case, where him and his wife saw the thing slither across the road in front of a car, and it like, comes with an intense fear. And he, he called the creature an abomination, so it terrified him. And there was another guy, um, what was his name? Um, Richard, oh, it's completely gone there. But mm -hmm. this, this guy saw the thing in 1973, 74, from his house on the shores of Loch Ness. And he said it was this great thing that reminded him of a, a stomach with a, a writhing length of gut attached to it. And he, he called it, he, he, <clears throat> uh, he, he said that there was this feeling of, of vileness about it that persisted. Mm -hmm. There was a feeling of obscenity, that's the word he used. He felt it was obscene and the, the obscenity. Sure. Um, the guy I was talking about earlier, um, F.W. Holiday, uh, who wrote the book The Dragon and the Disc and The Goblin, um, the Goblin Universe. He interviewed a, a librarian from Clifton in Ireland, a, a woman called um, Georgina Carberry, and she had seen the monster of Loch Fada, and she, once again, it was a mass witness sighting. She was there with breath. Okay. So had like a shark and a great long wormy body. She felt it was, it was terri she was terrified of it, and she would never go back to the loch again. And she said that even when they were driving away, after the thing had disappeared, she had this feeling of pursuit, almost as if it was coming after her. And I've heard that time and again. That, that sure. Was, there was a case of um, a Yowie sighting in um, Australia, the Yowie being the Australian wild man, uh, investigated by a good friend of mine called Tony Healy. And he said the witness said, after him, when he was being driven away in a car, he felt that the thing was somehow pursuing him, even, yeah. even though it, it wasn't there. And these things, creatures like Bigfoot, have been reported from Britain, which is impossible. Sure. It's a yeah, yeah, you're right. But other people have talked about that feeling of being stalked even afterwards. Like they, they feel like they're still being chased. Is that like a remnant of the sighting? I mean, what's causing that? Or do you think they're truly being stalked? Or is it just the, the fear and apprehension of seeing you know, something unknown? I think it's the, the gestalt memory rising mm -hmm. up to the subconscious. I mean, uh, uh, Britain is about the size of Oregon. It has 65 million people living in it. Most of our forests have been cut down. It's yeah. one of the most deforested countries in Europe. And there is no way a flesh and blood Bigfoot population could ever live in Britain without being detected. People see these things. But they sound yeah. more yeah. We investigated a series of sightings from a place called Bolam Lake, which is a lake with woods around it. It's about 600 metres across. You can't hide an eight-foot giant in there. But people said they'd seen this this great dark humanoid figure there. And we talked to um, a woman called Naomi and her son that had gone to investigate after reading about us in the paper. And they said they saw this thing standing there in the forest a couple of hundred feet from them. And they said it reminded them of Chewbacca from Star Wars, it was covered in great long hair. And they said they were terrified of it. And even though it was standing still, they had the feeling that it was charging at them. It was sort of mm -hmm. like projecting aggression. And they ran back to the car, and as they drove away, they had a feeling that it was somehow coming after them, even though there was nothing in the mirror. When yeah. They 
Well, that's that's something else because I mean a lot of people have said that after they've seen ghosts or if they've seen cryptids or if they've seen this, they've seen that that the that most, same feeling. The most extreme case is a friend of mine who is now a very well respected scientist. Very well respected scientist. He saw when he was a teenager with his girlfriend, he saw the corn owl man, which is a creature not unlike Mothman. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sighted on and off since the mid-70s in these woods around a, a church in a place called Mornham Smith in Cornwall, a small village. And he was walking one night with his girlfriend and he caught this thing in the light of his torch when he sh shot it up into a tree and it was squatting on a branch. And he describes it as this thing with glowing eyes, horns on the head, a great gaping mouth rather than a beak covered in silvery feathers, claws on the wings, looking like some demonic owl. And mm -hmm. he was absolutely terrified of it. And he said that even when he went home to Hampshire, which was, you know, hundreds of miles away, he felt that it followed him and that it was now lurking in the woods outside of his house that he could see from his bedroom and watching it. And he was having persistent nightmares about it. And even today, he doesn't like talking about it. He still gets goes to pieces from the intensity of the fear. Wow. Man. So it, it, it was that yeah. That profound of an impact on him that it's bothered him even to this day. Yeah. Damn. I mean, talk about staying power. What's the Richard, what's What's the most you've ever been scared? Uh, when I see large moths, I shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with massive crocodiles, venomous snakes, all sorts of things. The one thing I can't stand is moths. They, the way some people are scared of spiders, I'm scared of moths. I can't stand them. They're terrifying. Wow, so seeing moth man would really drive me nuts. Well, he doesn't really look that much like a moth. Yeah. When you hear the description, he's, he doesn't really look like anything else. <laughs> he's, he's yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that is true. But I've never been scared on an expedition, really. I mean, it was a bit hairy when I almost fell off a cliff in Russia. I was hanging onto tree roots. I had to scramble back up. But I've never really sure. been under threat. <clears throat> it's more the terrain of getting around that sounds like it's the scariest part. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been covered in leeches in Sumatra. One, I remember the second time we were there, three of us picked about 100 leeches from our legs. One uh, night campfire. No um, thanks, I'm good. I've been covered in mosquitoes. Um, I've, you know, had ticks on me in in um Mongolia when I was looking for the death worm and my one of my colleagues had had a tick a tick on his balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one place you definitely don't want to tick. Well the thing that interests me most is not the, the paranormal stuff, it's the it's the actual zoological stuff that you've got a chance of finding and proving exists. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For instance, with yeah. Worm. <clears throat> I went sure. About a thousand miles through the Gobi Desert on the Death Worm expedition, and you know, it's like going onto another planet, going to the Gobi Desert. Mongolia is the, the most alien and incredible place I've ever been. I mean, parts of the desert look like this part, part called the Mirror, because it's all chips of mica, so it's all reflected, so it looks like you're in a giant mirror. Uh, another part looks like a cat litter tray with all the little grain stretching away into infinity. Parts of it look like the surface of Mars. It's incredible. Um, we were caught up in a tornado that tore through the camp one time, and I was um, clinging to the side of one of our <coughs> old Soviet Army vehicles we were using. And I looked up like like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, and then saw one of our drivers 15 feet in the air <laughs> whipped around by this hanging onto the shredded tent. <clears throat> and the death worm itself talked to about 
20 odd witnesses and they all described the same animal sort of it look, looking like a salami or a draft excluder a battle mm -hmm. about your arm a brick red in colour and scaly and they're terrified of it it's one of these things that, that they, they believe it can spit a corrosive poison and uh, we talked to one guy who'd seen it in the 30s when he was a kid and he said that his family had packed up the girls, the circular tents they have, and got all their livestock and moved to another area. They were that frightened by it. it can, and the appearance of a of a, uh, a death worm can throw a whole community in, into panic. Sure. Well, yeah. It's the death worm, Richard. It's the death worm. <laughs> and the thing is that we talked to a guy who'd seen it just the year before, and we talked to another guy that seen it back in the 30s, and just about everywhere in between, and they're all describing the same animal. Mostly they just see it lying in the desert. One guy saw it catch and eat a mouse, and some people have seen it slipping in and out of holes. And it sounds to me, rather than a worm, it sounds like some sort of burrowing reptile. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. two candidates. There are a group of reptiles called amphisbanas, or worm lizards, and they're not really lizards, and they're not really snakes, but they're related to both of them. And they're these weird sausage shaped burrowing reptile, and I think the death worm could be a large, understood variety of amphisbana. And the sure. other kind of thing is some sort of sand boa. And the sand boas are short, chubby snakes that live in desert areas. So it could be an understood species of sand boa. And in parts of Africa, I think it's in um, Somalia, there's a, a sand boa, and the people there call it the apris. And they're terrified of it because they believe it's so poisonous that it doesn't even have to bite you to kill you. If you touch it, you'll die because of the poison. Jeez. But, Just in the poison secreting. But sun are completely harmless. They have no poison at all. It's what um, it's what Bernard Heuvelman's called the mythalization process. And stories yeah. told about an animal like they used to think that gorillas, the natives used to think that gorillas would tear branches off trees and beat elephants to death with them and come charging into uh, villages and carry off native women to rape them. In fact, um, gorillas have remarkably small willies, about the size of your uh, little finger. And they're, not <laughs> <laughs> and they're not aggressive at all. But these attributes were given to the gorilla because it looks big and scary. Yeah, yeah. I wow. The same with the death worm. I think it's, it's a perfectly harmless creature. It could probably give you a, a fair bite, but it's it, it doesn't spit poison. It doesn't generate blasts of electricity. <laughs> That's something else, though. That, you know, that the gorillas have small uh, packages. You know what I'm saying? They do. Human beings have the largest penis in relation to their body size of any primate. Wow, man, did not know that. That's that's one to break out during Thanksgiving dinner yeah. or during Christmas time. I'll be like, hey, <coughs> let's break the ice here. That's something else. Well, Richard, we're kind of running out of time here. Oh, go ahead, Al. Uh, no, Alex, no, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Let's see. We only got one minute left, so why don't you go ahead and tell people your websites, how they can get a hold of you, or your book, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, uh, the the website is it's the Centre for Fortean Zoology, so that's uh, that's um, www.cfz.org.uk, or if you just write Centre for Fortean Zoology in a search engine, you'll get it. Uh, my latest book, I've written a number of books. My latest one is called uh, Adventures in Cryptozoology, which is available uh, from Amazon. And if you want to contact me, my Email is dr3uk at, at yahoo.com. dr3uk at yahoo.com. And we're always looking for sponsors. The thing that very cool is, is lack of funds. It took them yeah yeah years. It took them seven years to, to find and film um, snow leopards in the wild. Seven years of being in the field. When we go and do an expedition, we get two or three weeks in the field because it's all we can afford. So if we could afford to do more and stay there more, we'd get more results. So we're always looking for sponsors. 
Exactly. Sponsor if you can. Visit the website. We've been talking with Richard Freeman for the last hour and a half. It's gone so quickly. Richard, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, definitely any time. And Alex, hey man, thanks for sitting in. We had a great, we had a blast, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Richard. Before you long, we're going to be saying, Doug who? What? <laughs> Who's that guy? No, just kidding. We miss you, Doug. Till next time, guys, this is Joel signing off along with Mr. Alex Hycheck. Take care of each other. Love each other. See you next week. I'm a UCare simplifier, which means I make your individual and family plan process nice and simple. Let's go through it step by step. Step one, go to minsure.org. Step two, see if you qualify for a subsidy. Step three, say EGADS. UCARE has some of the lowest rate plans in the state with a ton of benefits and a super large network so I can keep my doctor. Well, you don't have to say EGADS. Just trying to bring it back. UCARE, people-powered health plans. Go to minsure.org to enroll today. Again, you care simplifier here. Finding the right health plan can be tricky, but I'm gonna make it really simple. Ready? Here goes. You care individual and family plans offer some of the lowest rates in the state, and you care offers a variety of plans to fit your needs, all with 100% covered preventive care. It's really the best value for your money, with savings on gym memberships, healthy groceries, and much more. Make the simple choice: enroll in a you care plan on Mensure today at mensure.org.